A big hello to you. I hope I find you well. I'm Jenny Coke, welcoming you up here to Weir Yard. And today we're going to be talking about my top 10 favourite ready to run locomotives that represent preserved examples. Now, as you can see, I have quite a huge collection of locomotives, so there's a lot to choose from. But of course, a lot of these are locomotives that the real versions have long since been scrapped. And it must be said that um, it's been a little bit more difficult than I thought to pick out ones which represent preserved examples. It's been hard to go through my collection and pick out just 10 locomotives, but as we go through this video, I'd love to hear from you what your choices might be, whether you agree with mine, disagree, or what you would have picked for your personal top 10. So come with me in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCT decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support comes from This is Clark Railworks and this is what we do. You'll know us from Ellis Clark Trains and you'll get the same friendly expertise with us too. We've got a huge range of pre-owned model railways from all your favourite manufacturers and maybe some you hadn't heard of before. It's the place to come for quality. We don't stock substandard models and everything we sell is fully tested and photographed by model railway experts. No matter whether you model double O gauge, N, HO or more, we have sought after models from all around the world with new listings added every weekday. Check out what's available now at ClarkRailworks.com and don't miss out on your latest logo. I must admit that I'm a little bit of a hoarder and I've been collecting these models now for over 25 years. So you can imagine that it's built up into quite a collection. So that means there's plenty to go through and to see what we can choose for the top 10 of locomotives available ready to run that have real life preserved counterparts. Let's go. Us Brits are an odd bunch. We love to preserve things and we really do value our heritage, no more so in the form of preserved locomotives that exist in museums and on preserved railways up and down the country. Per head, we've probably got more preserved steam locomotives than any other country in the world. And it's testament to our love of these behemoths of industry that so many got preserved. In this video, I'm going to be outlining to you my top 10 favourite ready-to-run locomotive models of preserved examples. And the first one up is the Ivert C1 Atlantic. The real locomotive was a little bit of a curiosity. The LNER had already preserved a C2 Atlantic back in the 1930s, and the C1 Atlantic was finally withdrawn in 1947, and very quickly it was preserved and returned cosmetically to the same condition, outwardly at least, as that it ran in Great Northern Railway days. However, this wasn't a full mechanical redo of the locomotive, and it did mean that she was a very poor steamer when she ran rail tours in the 1950s, and this was because of the removal of the superheater elements, but leaving the boiler in the same condition that it would have been with those superheater elements. Nonetheless, she was preserved, and this model was commissioned by the National Railway Museum through their locomotion models from Bankman, and it was the first time that we saw the 442 Atlantic wheel arrangement from this manufacturer, and they did such a good job that it was very quickly followed by a number of other Atlantic wheel arrangement models. But this is the one that's in the Railway Museum, that's available, ready to run. It was available in the Great Northern Railway livery, LNER, and BR liveries too. The next locomotive that I've chosen is the Class 55 Deltic. This is a prototype that is definitely something of a bear moth of the rails. It was introduced as a direct replacement for some of the frontline locomotives on the East Coast Main Line. 
it used a rather unusual Napier Deltic formation engine. And that's an engine that's got three crankshafts, no actual cylinder heads, and three lots of opposing pistons in cylinders. It's a really quite curious design but it's incredibly powerful for the space and weight. And that meant that these, in their day, were one of the most powerful locomotives ever built. A number of these have been preserved, but for me, this particular one is the one that I've chosen to include in my top 10. The reason is I've got a soft spot for BR Green diesels, but I also love tops numbers, and this locomotive includes both of those. 55002, or the King's Own Yorkshire Light Regiment, was a locomotive that was repainted into its original livery, albeit with the full yellow ends and tops numbers, for running rail tours in the early 1980s. The Deltics had built up quite a large following, so it was quite fitting that BR catered for those who wanted to have one last opportunity to ride behind these machines. This locomotive went on to be preserved, and the model was made by a Curascale as part of their first production run of their all-new Class 55 Deltic. As a special for Rails of Sheffield, this really was the one that stood out for me, and it's why I chose to choose this for my top 10. The next locomotive that I've chosen is one that was made by Hornby, and this wasn't a special version in any way. As part of their main range, they produced it in LNER and BR liveries, but this particular one was factory fitted with their TTS sound in this North British livery. Although it has to be said that this is running as preserved, and this locomotive was saved by the Scottish Railway Preservation Society, and it was part of a larger fleet of J36s, but this is the one which they chose to preserve. Repainted back into its North British livery, it really is an eye-catching sight, but the J36s were real workhorses, originally of the North British Railway, absorbed into the LNER, and lasting right through into BR days. There's something very special about this locomotive. I just love its compact yet workmanlike charm. The TTS sound installation is actually not too bad. It was a shame at the time I wasn't actually a DCC modeler, and I had to buy this sound fitted locomotive because I really wanted the livery. It is nice to see that actually a lot of manufacturers now offer both sound and non-sound versions of each liveries, but back in this point in time, a lot of the manufacturers would produce a sound version that was a different livery or running number from the others. But since I've now gone DCC, I can appreciate the sound installation on this, and I'm quite happy to put it into my top 10 at number 8. The next locomotive that I've chosen, some people might find this to be a little bit of an odd choice, but I do really like the 9F. Now we've been spoilt a little bit in choice of the different versions that are available ready to run, and there are actually quite a few different preserved examples. But I've gone with this custom weathered 9F from Backman. Now some people might say that the all new tooled Backman model or indeed the new tooled Hornby model is the one to go for, but I firmly believe that the older Backman tooling does still hold its own, and I've got a number of these in my fleet. Evening Star number 92220 was the final steam locomotive built by BR. The 9Fs had a projected lifespan right through into the 1980s, so it seems quite a waste that they were all withdrawn through the 1960s and most of them ended up going for scrap. They also hold a rather dubious accolade of being one of the last steam locomotives to actually be cut up for scrap in the UK. In the early 1980s, one of the two steam locomotives that met this fate at Dye Woodham's Yard 
was a 9F, and it did rather spur the preservation movement on to snap up and purchase all of the remaining steam locomotives, so in some respects it did put out that warning call to the preservation movement. Evening Star, though, was to lead quite a charmed existence. The fate of the locomotive was secure even from the moment that it rolled out of the erecting shop, and BR always knew that this locomotive would be preserved, being that it was the final steam locomotive that they had built. It was also the only 9F to receive a name whilst working with BR although Black Prince has subsequently been named in preservation. For me, this is a great model, which still holds its own next to newer tooled examples, and I'm quite happy to put this in at number 7 in my list. The next locomotive that I've chosen is one of the smallest in this list, and it's one which I have to say that I've always had quite a love of, even when the previous version of the model was out there, which was a curious hybrid between an A1 and an A1X, and by modern standards looks just a little bit ropey, to be honest with you. However, it was great in its day when it was first introduced, but the Terrier was long overdue a revamp when the Rails Daypole version was announced. The Hornby version was announced around the same time as well, and suddenly we had something of a duel on to get not one but two models of the Terrier out there, both of which catered for a number of different detail differences, as well as both the A1 and the A1X varieties for the first time ever. I have to say that I do like both of these models, each having their plus and minus points, and certainly the one that I've chosen above all else is Box Hill, which is the example that is preserved in the National Railway Museum, and in this instance it's a Rails Daypole model, which has the fully featured sound in it, which really does make this model something special. My personal favourite livery is the improved engine green, which can't really be said to be green in the slightest. It's a kind of yellowy brown, but I really do like it, and as pre-grouping liveries go, it's certainly very eye-catching, and I've gone out of my way to pick up all of the examples that have been released so far from these new toolings. Both the Hornby and Daypole ones do stand up pretty well next to each other, so I've got no hesitation of putting these into my top 10. When it comes to the next locomotive, though, I have to say that um, it's something which you probably already guessed that I was going to have in this collection. The A4 Pacific is definitely a locomotive which features highly on my favourite lists. I've got more of these than pretty much any other type of locomotive, and there's something about the aesthetics of these which I find greatly appealing. Throughout the 1930s, streamlining very much came in vogue, but it has to be said that most of the locomotives that gained streamline quickly lost it during the war years and just afterwards. However, the A4 was the one exception to this, retaining its streak-like appearance right through to the end. In fact, so much so, I've not really got much idea what an A4 looks like without all the streamlining on, although I suspect it's a somewhat anonymous looking 462 Pacific, but they never ever ran like that. 
they also featured a number of quite interesting livery options, including this BR Experimental Blue, and my absolute favourite, the Experimental Purple, although I believe only four examples were painted in the Experimental Purple, and none of those survived to this day. Sir Nigel Gresley, though, is one of the locomotives that does survive. In fact, six of these A4 Pacifics did survive through a number of different quirks of fate. Mallard was the locomotive that had an assured place in the National Railway Museum, thanks to its 126 mile per hour speed record. Dwight D. Eisenhower was gifted to the US, named after their wartime general who then became a peacetime president. And it was an interesting state of affairs that also meant the Dominion of Canada was offered up and accepted for preservation in Canada. Back in the UK, Union of South Africa was purchased for preservation and bitten rounds off the sextet of locomotives. They could have been more. Silver Link was a locomotive that Billy Butlin actually negotiated to attempt to preserve for display at one of his holiday camps. However, he was thwarted by the indifference of the stores managers of the eastern region and instead ultimately turned his attention to preserving two Princess Coronation locomotives and a pair of Terriers too. And arguably, the loss of Silver Link meant that we did gain those Duchesses. I've also read somewhere that uh, Dominion of New Zealand and Commonwealth of Australia were offered up to their respective countries in the same way that Dominion of Canada and Dwight D. Eisenhower had been. The deal was they got the locomotives for free and just had to pay for shipping, and both countries declined. However, we do still have six preserved locomotives, and Sir Nigel Gresley is one of the sterling performers which is still out there running to this day, although sadly the numbers of the others that are able to run is slowly being whittled down as old age finally succumbs to them, and they get moved on into museums, with Union of South Africa being the latest locomotive to be shipped into a museum, as the cost of a rebuild would just be too much. But I'm really quite happy to add the A4 into my list of top 10 preserved locomotives. The next locomotive that I've chosen is one which had a very limited sphere of operation. There were two of these steeple cab locomotives and they were built for a very specific and very short railway line in Newcastle to run down to the Quayside branch from the Manor station and goods yard. The reason for the choice of these was because the line was steeply graded and on some quite tight curves through tunnels and the steam locomotive crews really quite detested the conditions that these tunnels would quickly become when these locomotives passed through, especially when working hard, and when the wind was in the right direction, it kept all of that smoke and fumes in the tunnels. The answer was electric traction, and the North Eastern Railway were actually quite advanced when it came to embracing electric traction, with an awful lot of the lines which eventually became part of the Newcastle Metro being electrified fairly early on. They also produced a number of electric locos to work the Shildon branch, and a lot of these were ones which ultimately proved the proving ground for electric traction that allowed the designs for things like the Class 76 and the Class 77 to benefit from the experience that they'd got. Two of these locomotives ran up and down the Quayside branch for quite a long time, lasting right through LNER period and on to BR days. And one of these locomotives, 26500, ended up being preserved and can be found in the National Collection. The other locomotive was not so lucky and was cut up. However, comparatively recently, a number of flame cut panels, including its running number of 26501, were found tucked away behind a shed at a pub, 
where it's not quite clear how they came into the possession of that property, but they were eventually saved when they were discovered and their significance was realised. There's something quirky about these steeple cab locomotives, probably much more common on the continent in places like Austria and Switzerland, the design nonetheless did proliferate in the UK. Apart from the Northeastern Railway that had a number of steeple cab type locomotives, they were also used in industry, particularly places like Kearsley Power Station, where they were quite useful, where there was a ready supply of electricity, and it proved to be cost effective to have these running, as they could be available pretty much 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. This model is made by Hellion and again was another special for Rails of Sheffield and when it was announced I just had to have it and I was not disappointed. So that's why I'm quite happy to add this into my top 10 preserved locomotives that are available ready to run. The next locomotive that I've chosen is another from Bankman and this locomotive was the result of a long overdue need to retool a model that had been available since the 1980s through both the replica and mainline labels. That model was seriously outdated, so when Bachman announced that they were going to tool a Class 03 shunter completely from scratch, it was one that was very much welcomed. This model is completely DCC ready using a 6-pin interface, although I believe that the most recent iterations of the Class 03 from Bachman have been upgraded to feature a Next18 socket. A number of different detail variances were also tooled up for at the same time. Some of the most notable of these are the differences between flower pot exhaust and the witch's hat exhaust, but also with and without air tanks for dual braking. There's also another version with the lower cab roof, which ostensibly was to be able to represent 03179 on the Isle of Wight, and that was produced as a special version for Model Zone in Network Southeast livery, and then subsequently in WAGN livery as Clive for the Backman Collectors Club, although that particular tooling has not reappeared despite speculation that it might be suitable for some of the Berry Port locomotives that had a cut-down roof to be able to run that railway line, which was laid in the bed of an old canal, and that meant very limited clearances underneath some of the bridges. 03066 was a main range model in the first tranche of releases. Bankman did a number of different versions of the 03, including BR Green and the BR Blue, and 0366 was chosen for this first release. The real locomotive is preserved at Barrow Hill Roundhouse. I really do love the little shunter locomotives. After choosing the production Deltic, it might seem like a strange choice what I'm going to show you next. But actually, the production Deltic has its charms, and the prototype Deltic has its own different charms. And that's why I've chosen this model that was produced as a special version for exclusively the National Railway Museum and has been so successful that it's gone through several different production iterations with minor detail differences. The prototype Deltic is quite a strange locomotive. It was built as a demonstrator, but very much with an eye on overseas sales. However, it was British Railways that were looking for a locomotive, and this fit the bill. For a number of years, it ran on Britain's railways until a catastrophic engine failure spelt the end for this locomotive, but by then it had secured an order for 22 production Deltics for English Electric, and that meant that it had done its job. Due to its pioneering engine design, 
it passed on into the Science Museum collection and ultimately to the National Railway Museum where it's still preserved to this day. It really does look something different with its French blue paint scheme, the grey roof and the strange continental looking headlights right slap bang in the middle of the bonnet. This wasn't just a warmed over version of Backman's first production Deltic but was in fact a completely new tooled model which took into account all of the peculiar quirks of the prototype Deltic and it has such a charm to it that I've got no hesitation to choose this as part of my top 10 locomotives. This next locomotive and the last in this top 10 is one which you might find quite surprising but it's a locomotive that in model form at least I've had a relationship with for most of my life. This is the BR Class 20 and as the uh, Type 1 from English Electric, it was one of the pioneering locomotives introduced as part of the BR pilot scheme. Arguably, it's one of the most successful of that scheme, but it very nearly wasn't that way. BR wanted to standardise on the Class 17, seeing it as being a much better visibility option, but given the really quite poor reliability of the Class 17, they reluctantly chose the Class 20. And actually that was quite fortuitous because it turned out that the Class 20 was an absolutely stellar design. More often than not, in later years, found coupled nose to nose, hauling merry-go-round coal trains, these were a very flexible locomotive. They could be used either singly or in pairs, quite readily with a single driver. They could often be found on some of the summer specials out to places like Skegness, or handling freight workings, they were equally well at home, and a large number of these have passed on into preservation. The doyenne of the class D8000, later 2050, was ultimately preserved and resides at the National Railway Museum in York. For me, my affair with this locomotive started with Hornby 00 and the D8000 class 20 that they produced and later on I also got D8017 which was the two rail version which had the exact same livery just that different running number. As far as I'm aware, D8000 and Mallard are the only two locomotives that Hornby 00 produced models of that have actually lasted through into preservation. And I can remember gazing at D8000 in the hall at York with great fascination because as a small child, this was the locomotive that I knew I had in miniaturized model form back home. And that was quite a fascination for me. Now I don't really generally buy the D-numbered diesel locomotives in green and certainly not the ones that are early enough to not even have yellow warning panels but D8000 is that exception. Having grown up with this in model form in my collection for longer than I can remember, when the National Railway Museum commissioned Backman to do a special run of these with this high gloss finish, I knew I had to have one, so I can remember calling in at Shildon on my way back from a family trip to Durham to pick one of these up and I just marched in and purchased this and it's been something that I have treasured ever since. I've subsequently fitted it with the Hornby Class 20 TTS sound decoder and I'll say a word for these, these are one of the best Class 20 sound files that I've ever heard. So much so that I wouldn't consider paying money for a much more expensive sound file for the Class 20 because the TTS really is a superb sound file and I'm looking forward to the day that Hornby add it to their all new TXS range. But for now, that completes my top 10 of favourite ready-to-run models that represent preserved examples. So there you have my top 10 ready-to-run locomotives that represent preserved examples. And I had great fun choosing these from my model collection. 
And I'd love to know from you, what would you choose to be in your top 10 list for the preserved locomotives that can be got in model form? I'd love to hear from you in the comments section down below. Do leave your own list and maybe you agree with some of my choices. Maybe you disagree. I'd love to know the reasons why. And I hope you really enjoyed this video and found it informative. Don't forget to hit that like button, share this video and subscribe to the channel to be the first to know about new videos as and when they go up. But until next time, this is me, Jenny Kirk, saying you take great care of yourself. Happy modelling. Bye for now. Today's video comes in association with Trainomatic, makers of DCC decoders and accessories that are designed by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. Find the full range available to order now at tramfabrique.co.uk. Additional support is provided by This is Clark Railworks and this is what we do. You'll know us from Ellis Clark Trains and you'll get the same friendly expertise with us too. We've got a huge range of pre-owned model railways from all your favourite manufacturers and maybe some you hadn't heard of before. It's the place to come for quality. We don't stock substandard models and everything we sell is fully tested and photographed by model railway experts. No matter whether you model double O gauge, N, HO or more, we have sought after models from all around the world with new listings added every weekday. Check out what's available now at ClarkRailworks.com and don't miss out on your latest logo. I'd like to thank everybody over on Patreon and an extra special huge thanks goes out to our Patreon heroes. Without you guys over on Patreon, we really wouldn't be able to keep making the video content that you see on this channel. And don't forget that you can also head on over to patreon.com slash Jennifer Kirk and check out the different tiers of rewards. Thank you so, so much. You are absolute legends.